Obviously, Chinese market motherboards are something that I have always been intrigued by. So when I saw this Jingyu X99 ITX motherboard on AliExpress for just $100, I knew I had to take a look at it. So what could go wrong with putting a late 2010s workstation and server part into a 10 liter volume case? As it turns out, quite a lot. Server room, this is the captain. Rhett, is there something going on down there I need to know about? Ah, we're on UPS backup, sir. The main paradigm couplers have come on a line. Uh, the tachyon router is uh, tangled with the secondary gazonta In router. English, Mr. Rhett? It's the bandwidth, sir. Getting it down is not the problem, it's getting it back up. Well, do what you can, but remember, I've got a budget here. I'm gonna have to call you back. Hosting your own servers also means you get to host all your own problems. Even the most skilled chief engineers will tell you you should decentralize your network. So why not host your services with Linode? If it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode. They offer shared CPU plans for as little as $5 per month and can scale as high as you need to go with dedicated CPUs, S3 compatible object storage, GPU hosting, NVMe block storage, and more. Linode is also expanding at light speed, with 12 new global data centers planned before the end of 2023. Visit linode.com slash craft computing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. That's linode.com slash craft computing, and again thanks to Linode for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing everyone, as always, I'm Jeff. You all got a sneak peek of my latest build in the last video, where I reviewed the Fractal Design Terra ITX case. And the reason I did the case review first was I wasn't quite ready to give a full review of all the parts inside. First off, what exactly was the plan here? Well, I was working on putting together a budget gaming PC with most of the internal source from AliExpress with a budget of around $500, not including the case or power supply. What I came up with was this, the Xingyu X99i, a mini ITX motherboard with a 2011 3 socket supporting third and fourth generation Xeon E5 processors, a pair of DDR4 memory slots, full NVMe Gen 3x4 support, all for $105 after shipping. Supporting Intel's Haswell Xeon CPUs means up to 22 cores and 128 gigabytes of DDR4 could potentially be crammed into this little shoebox. But I also wanted to take a gaming best bang for the buck approach, so I opted for the Xeon E5 2687WV4, a dedicated workstation CPU with 12 cores, 24 threads, a base clock of 3 GHz, and a max turbo of 3.5. It's basically the fastest single-threaded Xeon that you can buy outside of the 1600 series with their overclocking support. While the 2687WV4 will run you around $70, it is a great option, but there are some better buys out there, like the E5-2667V4. It only has 8 cores, but can be had as low as $30, and still has a 3.6GHz turbo. Server memory has absolutely plummeted in price over the last few years, so 64GB of DDR4-3200 register DCC was just $65, and $30 extra isn't going to make or break this budget. For storage, as space often is a factor on small form factor PCs, we're going 100% NVMe with a 2TB Gen 3x4 drive from Western Digital, and that can be had for around $90. And finally, we come to the graphics card, and really the main reason that I wanted to build this system in the first place. There has been so much talk on forums, by the community, and often repeated by reviewers saying that 8GB of video memory is not enough in 2023. So I figured I'd take one of the best buys from 2021 and put it to the test in the RX 5700 XT. This particular card is from Soya, available on AliExpress for $155 as of filming. It's based on AMD's RDNA Gen 1 and has 8GB of GDDR6 video memory. In total, you're looking at about $535, again, minus case and power supply for this entire build, as the Terra and Ion SFX don't really fit well into this budget. And that's kind of the point number one about the Jingyu X99i motherboard. While it is only $100, and CPUs and memory are beyond cheap for this platform at this point, small form factor PCs tend to be fairly expensive because of cases and power supplies. 
Adding the Terra and Ion SFX power supply ups the build price to $865. While that might be a decent price for an ITX system, those are definitely not the components that I would choose at that level of budget. Second, and I mentioned this in the original unboxing video about this motherboard, is the lack of cooler options available, specifically for ITX builds. While the X99i does have a 2011-3 socket, it requires a narrow ILM cooler to fit it onto the ITX board. That mounting pattern is typically only found on rack mount server boards and are often passive coolers that rely on chassis airflow. In general, it was never supported by many cooler OEMs outside of the server realm, which means if you're looking for a heatsink solution that doesn't drive a fan at 10,000 RPM, there really aren't many options out there. I found a single cooler available with a narrow ILM mounting pattern for the 2011 socket, an active fan, and more than two heat pipes, and that was the Dynatron R24, a 2U cooler with a 60 by 25 industrial fan. It's rated for 180 watts of heat dissipation, but that's only if the CPU fan is running at 100% speeds. Well, Noctua fan swaps are very popular in the home lab space for both servers and switches for a reason, so maybe that's a way that I can try and tame this CPU. Unfortunately, while the Noctua 60x25mm fan is significantly quieter than the Dynatron, even at 100% fan speed, the 2687W thermal throttled after just 5 minutes of testing in Cinebench. And that's with the CPU pulling only 128 watts, which is far lower than its rated TDP of 160 watts, and lower still than the 180 watt rating the cooler claims to be able to handle. Anyone looking to run this motherboard as a workstation without OSHA mandated hearing protection, you're going to want to do so at your own risk. Swapping back to the Dynatron fan and running at 50% speed yielded roughly the same results. So this is going to be an absolute no-go if you're looking for video encoding or professional workloads. But what about for gaming? Is this cooler enough to keep up with the latest titles? Only one way to find out. In Doom Eternal, the CPU maxed out at 81 degrees Celsius, with the Dynatron fan again set to just 50% speed. But this is a title that is almost entirely GPU speed dependent, so overall CPU utilization was sitting at around 5% the entire time, with only a couple threads seeing any significant workloads. Still, the CPU did pull 98 watts at peak power, and didn't seem to be climbing in temperature beyond that. Unfortunately, most other games that I tried wound up being CPU speed limited, but in single-threaded tasks only. Red Dead Redemption 2, Project Cars 3, even Teardown with its system-melting physics, I couldn't get temps on the CPU to climb above 70 degrees Celsius, let alone the 81 degrees Celsius that I observed in Doom Eternal. And that's more to the point of this platform being a little bit outdated when it comes to the latest games. In Red Dead Redemption 2 and Teardown, we see the CPU as being a massive limitation when it comes to single-threaded performance, with the GPU reaching only between 60 and 75% overall utilization at some moderate settings. Again, this is being paired to a graphics card that is only $155 today, and while there has been definitely a surge in graphics card performance in the last couple generations, this isn't exactly asking the world out of single-threaded CPU performance either. In the end, I'm really not sure how I feel about the Xingyu X99i motherboard. While X99 isn't a dead platform entirely in my eyes, its days are certainly numbered when it comes to gaming and workstation tasks. Case in point, the Earying 11900H motherboard I reviewed a couple months back was able to beat the 2687WV4 CPU in multi-threaded performance with eight fewer threads, and that's a combo that costs $20 less than the 2687W and the X99i, uses the same memory, and draws only 65 watts of power instead of 130, though getting that Earying combo in an ITX size is significantly more expensive. The cooling limitations are really what is keeping me from recommending this motherboard for anything outside of server use. The board does have dual Intel i225 gigabit ethernet ports and would make for a formidable PFSense box in the right environment. But outside of a server rack, even the Dynatron Active 2U heatsink is going to struggle to keep up under any intensive workloads. While you might be able to put 18 or even 22 cores into an ITX box, you're not going to be able to keep them cool enough to take advantage of that amount of CPU horsepower. And when it comes to gaming workloads, nearly all of my game testing was CPU limited when paired with even an RX 5700 XT, a GPU that only costs $155 today, meaning X99 isn't nearly the budget juggernaut that I was hoping for. So, as far as my original intentions for the system, asking whether 8GB is really enough video memory in 2023, 
that's going to have to wait for another day and a faster CPU platform, because there's no sense in going forward if I can't even get the games using 100% of the GPU. As far as the Jingyu X99i motherboard, if you have an interesting use case for it, I would love to hear about it in the comments below. Also, make sure to check out the video description for links to everything else in this build, and be sure to swing by craftcomputing.store to grab yourself one of our fancy new laser-etched pint glasses. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on the social medias at Craft Computing, and if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in projects like this, make sure to join the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Who put bong water in this? Beer for today is a seasonal from Elysian Brewing up in Seattle, Washington. It is the Elysian Dank Dust IPA. And this particular one is clocking in at 8.2%. All right, Elysian's Dank Dust. And if you don't know where the name comes from, I'm not going to tell you. I feel like I need to exhale. Holy shit. Man. Normally, this beer, in years past, that smell is right up front. It's right on the head of this beer. And then it leads into this nice citrusy orange, but still dank and flowery kind of flavor. In this case, I was kind of lulled into a little bit of a false sense of, hey, maybe this is just uh, a little bit of a skunky IPA with some nice citrus notes on top. Because that's certainly what the aroma says to me. What I got was the exact opposite. What I got was... All of the dank, all of the skunk, all of the flower, all of the whatever else you want to call it, right there on top. Right punchy in the mouth and uh It's not a bad flavor, <laughs> but I've had good shit that tastes less like good shit than this good shit. How's that? <laughs> oh. Go buy some today. <laughs> this is not a beer you're going to take down in gulps. Uh, in fact, I'm having a really hard time with it. Uh, I'm not sure that I like it. I I'm not sure that I like the, the inversion of the smell versus the flavor profile in this one. They really got all of the dankness into the liquid and not much escapes into your nose. And I'm not used to getting that flavor that way. And I'm not sure I really want to. <laughs>